welcome everyone. Welcome to another astral interview. And here with me, I have Raymond Keller. What an honor it is to have to be here with you, Raymond. Oh, thank you, Shiraz. It's always a pleasure to uh, share information and uh, to be on your program and and uh, especially to address our Canadian friends. Thank you. Um, I was it was just very recently talking to Robert Potter that. Um, he introduced me to various um, motifs in your books, and, and I got really excited to talk to you directly, and, and I'm so glad we're having this conversation now. Oh, thank, thank you. Yes, it was nice of Rob to, uh, to do that, and of course, Rob is having his uh, conference up in, uh, right. uh, up in Mount Shasta. That'll be the 26th through the uh, 29th of, of August at the, the end of the summer. And uh, if anybody's interested in getting information, Rob said it would be okay for me to give out his uh, Absolutely. Uh, phone so um, here, here it is. It's 530-925-3502. That's 530-925-3502. And he runs the Promise Reveal. He actually lives in Mount Shasta. Uh, That's right. One of, one of the more beautiful spots in North, uh, North America and an epicenter for uh, flying saucer activity. <laughs> That's true. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And, and you can reach out to me as well if you need to get a hold of Robert and I'll help set everything up as well. So yes, everyone, feel free. Um, so let's start with you, um, Raymond. Let's just start with like uh, a little bit about your life. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, your interests, how you got into the whole concept. Oh, sure, sure. I'd like to share a, an article. Okay. Uh, this is a, an article that was written about me that was on a, a, a popular website, uh, Rents News, uh, Alternative News from... Right from around the world. And um, uh, this is me in various locations. That's in my, uh, my home. I'm just sh sharing some, uh, some of the uh, comic book collections because in my book, I explore the connection between comic book superheroes and actual alien and encounters. Wow. And, yeah, this is an article that appeared um, in the National Enquirer in the 1960s. Um, okay. The young man up in the upper right-hand corner is myself, and also right. on the, in the, the center. And this is a publication yeah. that I published in starting in the mid-1960s, and I'm holding up, uh, we're holding up several of the consecutive issues of the Flying Saucer Report. So um, wow. you see that this clipping comes from the Gray Barker collection in, yeah, uh, I see. in uh, uh, Clarksburg, Clarksburg, West Virginia. And uh, Gray Barker was one of many people who we exchanged information with, uh, including Jean Duplantier of uh, Saucer Space and Science from Willowdale, Ontario, um, UFO, uh, research in Queensland, the Cleveland Ufology Project, and Earl J. Neff, who is the director and one of the original Untouchables. And um, wow. the reason that I got into all of this was because uh, back um, uh, at a scout camp, uh, we were coming back uh, from, from the camp out, my friend uh, right. Alan Weston and myself, Alan's and the on the right in the, the center. And we saw a disc shaped object, like this kind of like in this picture, hovering over a railroad trestle. And um, uh, I began to write articles for the Bedford Times Register, my hometown newspaper. And uh, I began with a series on, on UFOs and interviewing Earl Neff. And then I traveled with Earl Neff and the Cleveland Ufology Project to investigate flying saucer reports and to uh, uh, interview contactees and 
and UFO experiencers. Wow. All this was in the mid 1960s. Now, just recently, um, um, that one gentleman, uh, uh, oh, oh, Timothy Green Beckley, he just passed away uh, about a week ago. And uh, wow, That's a week ago, huh? Yes, uh -huh. he's one of the prominent ufologists, and uh, right, and uh, uh, he and I are the same uh, uh, are the same age. Uh, but uh, I also had uh, articles published in Raymond Palmer's Flying Saucers magazine from Amherst, Wisconsin, and uh, wow. so I've been in this uh, subject investigating it for quite. Uh, Quite a long time. Uh, yes, quite, quite a long time. In fact, I was one of the last guests on Timothy Green Beckley's program out of KCOR in, uh, in Las <laughs> Vegas uh, uh, last month. Right. I think I, wow. I, I, I might have been the last person that he, but he, that he interviewed. I was on there a couple times already. Wow. Wow. You'll have to, that's a whole other interview in itself, your relationship with him. Yeah, um, yes, all these ufologists that I've known uh, yeah. uh, work very closely with Gabriel Green of Amalgamated wow. Flying Saucer Clubs of America. And I was a member of APRO, the uh, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization in, um, right. in, uh, in Arizona. And uh, it was... Uh, so where were you... But were you involved with things like Project Blue Book and, and well, other? Uh, uh, Alan and I did have the opportunity to go interview uh, Major Hector Quintanilla Jr. at Wright Patterson right. Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. And we had that wow. exclusive interview in the pages of the, uh, uh, in the, pages of the uh, Flying Saucer re Report. Now, this is the first book that I wrote, Venus Rock. Right. Venus Concise history of the second planet. It's all fully illustrated all throughout. Beautiful, beautiful right. illustrations. And uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, who is the one of the first scientific consultants to APRO, Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, wrote the introduction um, wow. to to my book. And uh, I recently completed a series of articles like a 10 part series on the foundations of APRO that was uh, published on Lon Strickler's phantomsandmonsters.com. So if you just type in there, um, Keller APRO um, phantoms and monsters, it should take you uh, right there in case anybody wants to read it, it's free. And uh, I'm uh, uh, like a weekly contributor of a column to uh, phantomsandmonsters.com. The, 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 the articles that I'm currently uh, writing and publishing on there are the real resident aliens. So we've probably all seen that television program, the new one with John Tudyk. Um, but this is examples of real encounters with uh, extraterrestrials. And it's a, it's a 10 part series. I think it's up to uh, part six or seven right now. The question that arose was, um, when you were engaged with the UFO personally, is that your first experience of a UFO or had, did you have UFO experience before that? I know that was my first one. That was my okay, first well one and it, it, it got me into the, got me hooked, got me into the field. Right. And uh, I traveled with Earl Neff uh, all over the Midwest and uh, made other friends uh, locally, uh, uh, Michael LaRich and John Reese and others in the Cleveland U Ufology Project. We traveled to uh, New Jersey. We went up to, we even went up to Canada, to Ontario. Uh, we went all over the place <laughs> wow. on, the trail, on the trail of the flying saucers. And I guess I guess you have a record of all your all your travels and and all your findings as well. 
Oh, yes. And I, I have a, a, a whole garage that I have to rent. I have it out in the woods at a secret location where I keep all these old files. And so when I when I publish these books, uh, you'll see lots of never before seen information and photographs. Wow. Material, uh, documentation all about uh, the early history of flying saucers. Right, Alan, Alan Seinfeld just um, published his book, Making Contact as well. Oh yes, uh, I understand that he, that he was um, a speaker out there in um, Sedona, Arizona, and uh, I'm scheduled to, uh, to go there myself. I will be- oh, what? Uh, yes, that'll be at the Unity of Sedona. Right. Um, at uh, 40 Yucca Drive in Sedona, Arizona on the uh, 22nd of August. That's right, uh, yeah. At, uh, at one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. There's no, there's no charge for that. So, um, you know, if you're in the area um, or um, if you're traveling through, uh, by all means, come and uh, stop by. It's on the, uh, I think it's on the northwest part of town. So, so in all your UFO travels, tell us about certain things that really stood out for you. Well, my my big fascination has been with the uh, uh, been with the planet Venus and the the contact right. from, from Venus, and of course, I've met many uh, many, uh, many Venusians through my travels and investigations, and uh, I right. write. About all of these in uh, uh, in my books. In 2018, we had the From Venus with Love conference at uh, at at Mount Shasta. There were many uh, many star seed Venusians as well as 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 other Venusians that uh, you know that come and go that that are uh, clandestinely uh, there uh, in in our midst. Right. And, uh, the, in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, it says that uh, that we should always be kind to one another, for know ye not that ye entertain angels unawares. And of course, uh, Dr. Frank Stranges and others yeah. uh, have, have talked about uh, the angels in our midst, the angel force of the extraterrestrials, especially the Venusians and the, the hierarchy of light and right. so forth. And and that'll be the that'll be our subject for the um, uh, the Mount Shasta conference as well. The the heart of light. Can you speak a little, little bit, uh, give us a little synopsis of what you mean by the heart oh, of light? Oh yes, yes, by 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 all means. Um, uh, well, I've produced uh, various uh, documents from the from the nineteen fifties and and forward to 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 prove that uh, um, the existence of this hierarchy has been known for, uh, uh, for a long time in association with, uh, with flying saucers. At the uh, Flying right. Saucer Convention in April of 1954, it was uh, George Van Tassel at Giant Rock at Landers Field that, uh, that announced the, uh, the existence of the Confederation of planets, that there are uh, 51 solar systems and 601 planets that are that are members uh, of this group. And, and of course, we know that um, the inf infinitude of space is filled with intelligences. Um, right. Elena Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society and others have, have told us that for a long time. Um, for, for a long time, but within our local sector, uh, right. the Milky Way galaxy, this is where the Earth is uh, is located. I'm I'm referring to that particular sector. So in the Milky Way galaxy, there's 51 different universes. Uh, there's 51 um, solar systems. Solar systems uh, that are that are in the. Um, Confederation of Planets, and there's 601 planets. Uh, okay. Terry members. Uh, some of those, of course, are moons or plant planetoids or even space platforms. Uh, 
artificial constructs. Um, and each of those, and each of those have life on them. Uh, yes, they all have. They they all have life, and uh, and we know that all of the uh, all the planets and moons in our solar system are inhabited, not necessarily with in, indigenous life forms, but with uh, with life forms that have been transported there from uh, uh, from other worlds. Great. Okay, I understand now. So now, when you talk about the hierarchy of life, uh, what comes to mind is that in his hierarchy of light in the angelology that he wrote about. Is there, is there a connection? Would, were you referring to uh, like Zachariah Stitchin or, or? No, I was referring to Dionysius. He's the, he's Dionysius. He wrote, he's the one who wrote about the angelology and the nine different le levels of the angels. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yes, this is this is very and broken into broken down and broken down fire. Oh, yes. There's a there's a level of dimensionality that uh, that we're dealing with on on the other um, on the other planets. The best way I could describe this is a sort of attunement, a finer attunement, okay. uh, a finer vibration. Uh, a much lighter um, density that the closer we get to the uh, to the central sun, and uh, we could see the uh, we could see the effects of the great central sun uh, when when we look through the constellation of S Sagittarius, because uh, it's clouded over by uh, by by nebula and it's uh, uh, it's essentially a black hole at the center of the uh, of the um, of the galaxy at the center of every galaxy. Okay, now uh, there's so many planets to go into, and so many um, so many beings to go into. Is there some place that we can we can learn about the hierarchy of these beings and who they are and what their characteristics are and 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 um, and who's made contact with them? Oh yes, um, yes, we certainly can. Uh, I work with a lot of material from uh, from various contactees, and addition to the material that I have and that uh, that that I've written about, my very most recent book is um, the Lady Columba of uh, Venus Revelations, and uh, I'm going to pull up the. The advertisement that was in Fate magazine for that book. Okay, this is uh, Lady Columbia right. Venus Revelations, and uh, it's detailing how Annabelle Krebs, um, she was born in 1902, and survived the the Great Plague, uh, Spanish flu, of. Um, not 1918 through through 1920, but she was a theosophist and a student of metaphysical arts, mystic arts. She traveled to India. Um, she lived in Germany and Europe. Um, um, she was quite quite an investigator of the the paranormal for for her time. But in the 1950s, uh, she moved out to Joshua Tree in uh, okay. Southern California. And she had many experiences with Venusians traveling to, uh, to other worlds and so forth. Uh, and she met a friend there, uh, a Russian cos cosmonaut, uh, a young cosmonaut in, uh, in training that was on a secret, secret mission. They both traveled with, uh, with the Venusians to a base on the far side of of the moon, they traveled uh, underneath the the sea um, in a submersible um, in a submersible saucer, and uh, all of her adventures and revelations are in this uh, in this new book. And uh, I'm going to share some of the things here uh, with her encounters with various uh, extraterrestrials. This is the book, right, Lady Columba. Yeah. And um, 
So, um, so you, you met her? Oh, yes. Um, yes, I've met her and, uh, oh, here, here we go. This is, this is her own artwork. You see that that's the moon base, moon base Clarion. That's on the far side of the moon. So you see, yeah, this is in uh, Lady Columbus' book. This is her own artwork. That's her with uh, Alexander. They're on the far side of the moon uh, on the base Clarion. Um, and you see various types of spacecraft uh, in the background, cigar shape. Uh, motherships, uh, patrol craft, Saturn class, scout, scout ships, and and so forth. And uh, yeah, I, so I, when did you meet her? So when did you originally meet her? How did you originally? Okay, um, she had uh, come down. Actually, came down to uh, uh, to a meeting that up in the in the woods in Pennsylvania. She and a woman named uh, Lady Aurora and announced themselves as uh, as being from the the planet Venus, and uh, they were just coming there to uh, celebrate the uh, publication of my uh, second and third book. Wow! And the, yeah, this is uh, this is also this is. This is in uh, done sometime between the late fifties and sixties, and early sixties, and you see uh, uh, Vorton in the middle, and then uh, um, to his side, the woman with the beret is uh, Commander Aura Reigns. Okay. And uh, so th there's all kinds of art by her uh, in in the book, as well as uh, uh, other interesting photos. And um, these books are available uh, on Amazon, but if they run out, uh, probably to go to headlinebooks.com, headlinebooks.com. They're the publishers and they're in Terra Alta, West Virginia. Uh, I'm, do, you have, do, you, do you have PDF versions of? Um, yes, the first book is, uh, the first book is, uh, on Kindle, uh, so you could get it. Um, it's on Kindle and Nook and and others, and and uh, the Lady Columba book is also going to be cool. coming out soon. Uh, with um, that'll be coming out with an audio version, and uh, that was made by uh, uh, a newscaster, uh, a woman from. Uh, uh, Miss Springs, uh, she was with the CBS television affiliate in Las Vegas, so she did the uh, the, the reading for that, and uh, that'll be that'll be very um, delightful, uh, entertaining, and as well as enlightening. Um, and uh, you might enjoy that if you're on a long drive and so forth. Uh, you know, you could just um, right in and. Uh, I hear yeah, audio version would be. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, tell me then, in, in your years of research, what are specific, um, specific um, situations or specific experiences you've had that kind of stand up above above the rest? Well, in my uh, in my very first book. Um, I tell about the encounter on Mount Shasta. We had a group of uh, right. UFO believers called OSIRIS, Outer Space International Research and Investigation Society, with right. 15 chapters around the world. Some of us got together in Salt Lake City with the chapter there. Uh, right. There were there were uh, eight of us. We went up to uh, we went up to the slopes of Mount Shasta. Uh, with Reverend Clayton Parker uh, from uh, uh, Murray, U Utah. And um, uh, he said that we would uh, uh, meet an ascended master up there. And um, we, 
we were, were kind of doubt, doubtful of that, but he, he said he was 87 years old at the time and he couldn't go up there by himself. So he told us to uh, just follow this path and uh, start walking toward the, the top of the mountain uh, from, the, from the parking area. Uh, so we did. We got above the tree line to a point where um, there was a brook, a uh, little brook. And uh, uh, we sat down there to rest. And then uh, uh, the, this spring of there, where there was a spring of water there. And then a, just a, a, a woman appeared. Um, she appeared out of uh, just uh, out of thin air. Uh, she had a white jumpsuit with the uh, gold braid on it. And uh, she said that uh, her name was Lady Ankara. And uh, she was patrolling in the Sirius star sector and that um, she was standing in a bilocation si signal with us that connected with the Sirius star system to a planet called Balaton. And that uh, if we were to look at the slopes of Mount Shasta, we'd be able to see these mantid-like beings anywhere from five uh, to 15 feet in length moving up and down um, the mountain. And then she explained that uh, they were establishing a confederation colony on, uh, on this planet Balaton. It was a super earth, about three times the size of the earth, but mostly mountainous terrain similar to uh, similar to Northern California or British uh, Columbia, the Pacific Northwest. And um, uh, she explained how it was a patriarch a matriarchal society uh, that they right. lived communally in these in these vast log houses and uh, that the, the women uh, had the ability as the, the leaders to communicate telepathically with the la larger mantids and to open and close stargates and, and travel to certain uh, certain vort vortices through vortices to various uh, planets uh, scattered throughout the galaxy. I guess like a, a, a tunnel of wor a collection of wormholes, tunnels through space and time. And uh, we were there with her for about three hours, and she answered all of our questions about flying saucers, and okay. said that she would um, she would see us again someday. Uh, we all uh, hugged her, embraced, and then uh, uh, she disappeared in the same manner that uh, uh, that she came, and. Uh, then on the way back to, uh, to, to Utah, when we got back to, uh, uh, to Murray, um, we took the, uh, 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 Kay Studstrup was the one, it was the director of that local group, uh, took the photo um, roll of film to the photo mat, a local photo mat. And we were all gathered around, but she wasn't anywhere to be seen. So it was like um, just the uh, light and everything just went right th right through her. She was uh, invisible in the in the picture. So we were we were all astonished, and uh, that uh, that account is in the uh, book. It's in the last chapter. So that's the uh, uh, the, the uh, account of the uh, the first. Uh, close, intimate encounter like that. And uh, right. she said her name was um, uh, was Lady Ankara, of course. But then uh, uh, Reverend Parker um, said that, uh, that that was a woman that he, he grew up with. But he was born in, uh, eight, uh, he was born in uh, uh, 1899, just a year later than her, her, uh, his friend, which was Annalise Scarron. He said that was uh, that was Annalie Scarron, uh, who was born on the seventh day of the seventh month, at the on the seventh hour, in uh, wow. 
Falls, I, Idaho. And um, she, uh, she went on to write uh, nine books on uh, the subject of um, translation, not, not of languages or anything, but what we're talking about. Right. Uh, uh, we're actually speaking about uh, moving through, through time and space uh, by, right. by location and, uh, and the teleportation. Uh, to other uh, to other worlds and le leaving this earth and um, becoming synchronized with the conditions on uh, on on other planets. Right. Now, uh, uh, so she was um, uh, she was a very fascinating uh, uh, woman, and uh, uh, and uh, we were just uh, blown away um, to to be in. Um, to be in her presence. So in your book, do you document all the questions you asked her and the, and the responses she gave or? Oh, yes. Okay. They're, they're documented in there. And then uh, there's also uh, in the first uh, book, there's a section there on page 252 uh, for establishing your own starseed connection. Uh, right. you ask yourself a series of questions uh, and uh, uh, determine your your EQ, your extraterrestrial quotient. Right, right. And that that's a that, that's a few pa pages long, but it's very um, very interesting. Fascinating. Okay, so that's what EQ stands for. Yes, uh, that's 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 right. Um, yeah, I can go over s some of them if you. Uh, if you would like. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It turned right to the page. <laughs> <laughs> of course it did. Yeah, it's on page 252. It's, it's called Star Seed Activation. Right. But, but basically, um, you know, we're looking at physical uh, characteristics. Uh, um, among them, compelling eyes, great magnetism and personal charisma, sensitive to electricity and electromagnetic fields, lower body temperatures than normal, chronic sinitis, extra or transitional vertebrae, hypersensitivity to sound, light, and colors. Right. And uh, odors. Swollen or painful joints, pain in the back of the neck, adversely affected by high humidity, uh, survived a life-threatening illness, involved in severe accident or trauma, uh, and and so forth. And there's various uh, there's various categories in there within that. Yeah, emotional, um, and then you go down this list: extraterrestrial experiences, out of body right. experiences metaphysical experiences, uh, psychic development, how to access the signal, and various actual frequencies that you could tune in uh, right. via radio sets and ham sets to, uh, to Venus. And you could listen to uh, the, the planet. It has, it's the only one with a dual resonant frequent, uh, frequency. So there's a lot of really cool information. Um, is the only planet with a dual, dual, re a dual resonant, resonant frequency? Dual resonant frequency, yes. If, um, if you turn to 221.23 hertz or 409.1 hertz, um, you can actually listen to the planet Venus. It actually sounds like it's si singing to you. And, right. Um, uh, I've seen where people have put those frequencies to um, to to uh, musical renditions and notes and and so forth for for meditation and it's just really awesome. So I could show you some of the things from the uh, the, the book if um, if you would like. Okay, this is. Uh, Okay, um, I'm going to go to uh, this, uh, the first, like maybe the first three chapters. 
Okay. That be oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. Is that coming through? It is. Yeah, oh. I can see. Oh, okay. Great. Great. Oh, okay. Well, um, the book is called Venus Rising, A Concise History of the Second Planet. And uh, the reason that I wrote it was because um, Helena Blavatsky wrote the first history of a planet from Venus on a metaphysical level, a spiritual level, and an extraterrestrial level. But that was uh, back in 1885. So that was uh, a long time That's ago. So that's the secret doctrine you're referring to? Uh, well, this was even before the secret doctrine or Isis unveiled, even before right. any of these. It was her very first work, metaphysical work, called History of a Planet. Uh, oh, wow. all, all about the mysteries of Venus. And oh, wow. Know that. Okay. And, and my, my book came out 135 years later. Yes. It, it's a concise history of the second planet. Hers was like a booklet. Right. Mine, is, mine is over 300 pages. Right. Uh, so um, her book, her booklet on Venus, I haven't read that one. So give us a little, just a, a little synopsis before we go into yours so we can compare it. Oh, okay. Um, uh, she talked about the historical context of Venus uh, in theosophy and astrology first, and um, and the significance of of, of Venus as a, a muse of right. human history, spurring uh, development of of higher levels of of consciousness within the context of of theosophy, and of course theosophy is a movement that has three objects um, to it. Uh, one uh, being the uh, uh, the universal acceptance of of, uh, of humankind, uh, regardless of um, of uh, uh, race, nationality, um, uh, sex, gender, uh, religion, and right. so forth. Promoting the the brotherhood and sisterhood of all humankind, right. and, that, and and our connection with. Uh, uh, with our brothers and sisters of other other planets as, as well, and then it's the uh, the pursuit of knowledge wherever we find it. So it would be regardless of um, you know regardless of uh, of uh, what religion it comes yeah, from, what field of research uh, in science, uh, biology, uh, uh, astronomy. That uh, you know, truth is truth. Uh, uh, where, wherever we find it. And then uh, last but not least, uh, and one of the reasons that I wrote, wrote the book was um, for the augmentation of uh, the, the powers within us, uh, right. accessing our starseed potential. Right. Uh, we, we all know we have the five senses. Right. Yeah. But we know from the appearance of... Uh, of angels and uh, aliens and other advanced beings here, here on the earth, that there are other powers that, that we can attain uh, uh, attain to. So Venus uh, likely a, infinite, likely infinite. I mean, the, there's Islamic texts that say we have sixteen senses, for example. Oh, oh yes, and uh, and there's there's probably many more than that. Uh, Absolutely, infinite. Te telekinesis, um, uh, mental telepathy, uh, uh, automatic writing, um, uh, astral projection. I mean, the list goes on, uh, mm -hmm. on, and on of the things, uh, uh, telekinetic abilities. I mean, it goes on and uh, on, on and on. And uh, we know that Venus and many of the worlds in the confederation of planets are millions of years in advance uh, of us. So we have a lot to learn from them. And that's my mission in writing these books is to present that information to, to help us develop those abilities within ourselves and also to promote conditions on earth that will make our world a paradisical uh, glory. Okay, uh, well, you know, Venus has always been a muse for for scientists, artists, um, his, historians, philosophers, down through 
the ages. And this is a, a beautiful poem that uh, expresses that. Uh, Amy Lowell in 1915. For me, you stand poised in the blue and buoyant air, cinctured by bright winds, treading the sunlight and the waves which precede you ripple and stir the sands at my feet. Beautiful, yeah. Um, Sandra Botticelli's The Birth of Venus. Uh, this is a, uh, can be viewed. The original can be viewed in the uh, Fusi Gallery in Florence, uh, Florence, right. it, Italy. And uh, of course, uh, on the back of my Venus books, I have a photo of myself standing in front of various statues of, of Venus. One was by an artist with uh, my same last name, uh, who, who might have been a remote uh, remote ancestor. <laughs> There's, right. Yeah, right there. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, Philadelphia Museum of Art. They have a Venus, a whole Venus room and everything. Oh. Have yeah. you been there? Um, yes, I, I I was there. That's where that picture was taken. Okay, excellent. And, uh, yeah, they they invited me over there, and I gave copies of my book to to uh, to everybody, autograph them, and everything. It was very very exciting. Now, our our ancestors um, in the in the ancient world, in all cultures and civilizations, uh, it's unique that uh, all these different cultures, no matter where they were in the world, recognized um, the planet Venus as emblematic of uh, a goddess and a goddess type uh, energy. And that's because uh, Venus is a planet that when it's in close opposition to the earth, you can actually see a planetary tail on it, similar to a comet that extends for about uh, five million kilometers into space. So when the ancient people saw it, they said, oh, those are the golden tresses uh, of the, the goddess. So you see, uh, you see the Sumerians re referred to uh, uh, Venus as uh, Inanna, um, the, the Babylonians as Ishtar, um, uh -huh. the uh, uh, Phoenicians as Astarte, uh, the Greeks as a Aphrodite, um, the 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 Aztecs and the the um, the Maya de develop their calendar uh, according to the orbits of Venus. Which you know you'd think it would be the sun or the moon or the something, sun. you know. But it's a uh, it's the uh, 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 fifty two year cycle of, uh, of of Venus, and it's very very uh, very unusual. Uh, but they, they all recognize Venus as the uh, as the feminine uh, energy, which is very, uh, very, very apropos. Okay, so uh, Venus and Earth are often thought of as twin planets. This is because uh, Venus is only about 200 miles in diameter less than the Earth. So oh. on a cosmic scale, that's uh, hardly anything. That's the distance mm -hmm. uh, from, say, Cleveland to Detroit. Um, so it's not, um, you know, it's not that big of a difference in size. They're both terrestrial planets and they both have uh, atmospheres. And the more we study about Venus, the more we find out just how similar to, to the Earth it is. And in uh, one of my other books is uh, the Vast Venus Conspiracy, that's my fourth book. I explore those in great, uh, in great detail, as well as in uh, the second book, Final Countdown, Rockets to Venus. And uh, wow. let me go over some of the, like this is, this is the book, The Vast Venus Conspiracy. Right. And, uh, in that book, we see where the, uh, the, there's ice crystals in the atmosphere of Venus. There's actually uh, uh, oxygen there. Uh, we see that the heat that's detected in the atmosphere is really electrical heat in the ionosphere. 
they say that Venus, uh, you know, NASA, never a straight answer, N-A-S-A. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you that uh, you know that the surface pressure on Venus is uh, uh, ninety three times greater than on the Earth. You know, like the bottom of the ocean, and that the the atmosphere is uh, poisonous and there's toxic clouds and and mm -hmm. you see the photos from the Russian uh, Venera thirteen and fourteen space probes that actually landed on the surface of Venus. It looks like a clear day in New Mexico <laughs> or, or Arizona. <laughs> like there's some kind of vegetation in the background. <laughs> and uh, there's no heat waves coming off of the rocks or, uh, or anything like that. There's no darkened skies filled with, uh, uh, you know, fill, filled with lightning bolts or anything uh, it looks very similar to uh, uh, very similar to to the earth so there's uh, you know many many uh, uh, many more things about uh, Venus the bi uh, diamagnetic properties of the gases in, in the atmosphere uh, result in the uh, oxygen and the breathable gases being uh, uh, closer to the surface, the earlier Soviet probes, and even the earlier Mariner probes on our part uh, uh, to, to Venus showed the atmospheric pressure to be uh, only eight times greater than the Earth. So when, so when you say diamagnetic, can you define that? Oh, um, yeah, we're, we're talking about the, uh, uh, how the, um, um, you know how the, the 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 gases accumulate and and how they form in tiers, uh, in 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 levels, uh, and so forth, and uh, so you find that the uh, uh, how they diffuse uh, uh, through the atmosphere, and then uh, another thing also is the uh, what they call the um, Albedo effect. Uh, this is the fact that 90% uh, of the light that reaches Venus from, from the sun is reflected back off of the planet uh, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere. And that's why Venus appears as the, apart from the sun and the moon, appears as the third brightest object uh, in the sky. And so with all that light reflected back into space, um, you know, where's the 10% where's the, the that reaches the surface? Uh, how is that going to cause um, any significant um, greenhouse, of, runaway greenhouse effect? So there's uh, just too many, uh, uh, too many doubts uh, about it. And in my book, um, the, uh, a final countdown rockets to Venus. I look yeah. at a top secret report, uh -huh. Project White Stork, which was conducted by the Air Force, United States Air Force, that was monitoring the Soviets' exploration of outer space, and particularly the, the, the planet Venus. And there's many startling and amazing uh, findings that are in that book and explained about the the actual habitability of, of the planet Venus. And then beside this dimension, there's other dimensions as well, um, where, where there's even more advanced forms of, uh, of life on Venus in, high, in higher... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, higher frequencies, higher vibrations, and, right. and so forth. One of, uh, one of our friends, uh, Omnek Onek, the ambassador from Venus from the fifth dimension was a speaker at Mount Shasta at the From Venus with Love in, in 2018. Right. And she, she explained some of um, some of that to the um, to to the audience there. So is she is she accessible or do, are you in touch with her? Oh um, um yes, yes. I'd uh, love for you to connect us. Oh yeah, I'll, I will uh, try to do that. I don't think she's uh, uh, she's re retired now, but
but she still she still writes, but uh, she she might. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll um I'll see what I could do. Right. So this is a picture of uh, a craft from Venus. Uh, well, this is a this is a, a done from a study by NASA that they wanted for the future. Oh, they just recently announced today that they're sending two more probes to to Venus. Interesting that it that it comes out right now just after the Defense Department announced that there's a real technology behind uh, UFOs, but they're not saying that it's uh, that, that it's extraterrestrial. But I thought right. that more 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 than coincidental. But there's a study that was conducted. Um, it was criticized by Senator Jeff Blake from Arizona because he was saying that uh, that uh, if if Venus is so hostile, then why are you spending all this money ma making plans to go there and set up um, colonies and uh, uh, and so forth? So a good 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 question. But uh, NASA never right. answered it. But this was an illustration uh, for one of the uh, settlements. They they wanted to first uh, send like these balloon dirigible type craft, and then gradually develop it into uh, uh, into floating cities, kind of like on Star Star Wars. So I thought that was uh, that was pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. That was just the first chapter uh, in, the, <laughs> uh, in the book, but uh, uh, you know, as I uh, as I go on, it gets uh, into many many deeper uh, sub subjects. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, this so, this one uh, is. So Venusians are are um, are benevolent, then, right? Oh yes, um, yes, they're they're very benevolent and. Uh, they aren't the original inhabitants of the world. The, the in, original inhabitants are uh, an indigenous species of bees, very large uh, kind of bees, a uh, great variety of, uh, of, uh, uh, of bees. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the humanoid Venusians, uh, have adapted to the planet over millions of years. Uh, they originally come from a star system in Tau Ceti called uh, a planet called Norca. And that planet was uh, turning into a vast desert. And uh, they made their way across space and settled on, um, settled on Venus countless, uh, uh, countless aeons ago. So how do we know that the original the original were bees. Uh, well, um, I can show you that because I've got some nice stuff there. Okay, we know that uh, this 13-8 pattern represents a Fibonacci uh, sequence. Right. So in the, in the orbits of Venus, for uh, we see that a Venusian year is shorter than a, than an earth year so the number of orbits will always around the sun will always be many more than the than the the orbit of the earth but it's always in a fibonacci it's always in a uh, direct fibonacci ratio so for every 13 orbits of venus there's eight of earth for every eight of venus there's five of earth for every five of earth there's three or for, for every five of Venus, there's three of Earth. So it's always in a Fibonacci sequence. So why is that important? Okay, one of the things that uh, um, Nikola Tesla, who, who devised various communication devices for communicating with, with uh, other planets, in 1898, he had a device called a Tesla scope. Right. And uh, he heard signals from Venus, and they, it was uh, the humming of bumblebees and bees. And Tesla was very obset, obsessed with two things, bees and doves. I which, remember that. Yeah, yes, and the, the um, you know, when we 
when we look at D Diana, we see she was associated with the bear, uh, Athena with the owl and so forth. Uh, well, Lady Venus was associated with bees and, and doves. And when we look back in history, we see the Roman emperors, uh, various kings and queens, and the Cathars, the Merovingians, they all um, embroidered bees on their clothing and their, their robes, uh, the, the leaders, uh, religious and, and secular leaders, because uh, they recognized that uh, the bees were the Sufis. And of course, in the Sufi tradition, uh, it's recognized that, you know, Rumi and others had said that uh, the bees were a gift uh, from the Venusians for the, for the people of Earth. That's interesting. I'd love the source of that. Um, there's a whole chapter on bees in the Quran as well. So. Oh, oh yes. There's a, there's a surah called the bee. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I've actually, <laughs> I've actually read it. I've read it from cover to cover. And there, there's actually a treatise in, in um, there's, a, there's an Islamic treatise called um, The Case of the Animals Versus Man in the Court of the Jinn. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, yeah, and the, the jinn were very supernatural beings, much uh, akin to the uh, angelic hosts in the, uh, in the right. Judeo-Christian tradition. Right. Wow, fascinating. Okay, uh, let's see. So getting back to the bees. Oh, okay, here we go. Okay, so now the, the number of any, it's interesting because uh, besides these ancient references uh, to, the, to the bees, um, to the goddess Venus and um, through uh, uh, Islamic and, and Sufi um, uh, legends and so forth. Um, we, and uh, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla wrote an article in, in uh, 1925 about the future organization of society. And he said that it should be patterned after a B. Uh, a collective. Uh -huh, and a collective, uh, collective society. So we see, you know, the queen of outer space. Okay, yeah. Um, so this is uh, um, this is how it works out that it's an exact Fibonacci ratio because uh, in in Earth, uh, eight years um, is two thousand twenty-two days. Yes, uh huh. And then you see on Venus, thirteen years is two thousand. 921 days. So 99.9% equivalent. So it's exact Fibonacci match. Wow. And in the, in the uh, Earth Venus cycle, in the wow. orbit cycle around the sun. So then we see that uh, uh, mathematicians have also noted the expansion of Fibonacci numbers within a rectangle converts into a golden spiral. Uh, the very shape assumed by myriad millions of galaxies to include our own Milky Way galaxy, in addition to many recurring phenomena visible and apparent throughout the, the, the natural world. So on the left, you see the grid, and then, and then on the right, you see the, the spiral graft of the, the Fibonacci golden spiral. And so how do we know that, uh, that the bees and the Venusians have been here, have they left a calling card of, of some kind? Right. So this is the, so some of the things that I'm looking for. Now in the right. beehive, um, the number of bees in any hive is always going to be a Fibonacci number. And we know that because of the way that the bees re reproduce themselves uh, in the hive, as you, you see here. One, two, three, five, eight, wow. Uh -huh. Not many people pay attention to that, but it's but it's very important. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a good many of the crop circles display this golden spiral or other pattern resulting from the use of a Fibonacci sequence. Oh, so yeah, the, the golden mean is everywhere, absolutely. 
Oh yes, and so this is the this is the Venusians leaving their calling card that that right. they, they've been here. So we see this we see this pattern throughout history. And it's so how in, do we know this pattern is Venusian though? Oh, uh, because of the uh, because of the Fibonacci uh, spiral and the bees and everything. Because the the name that the Venusians call their planet is Abahar, which means planet of the bees. Right. But I mean, the golden mean or the golden ratio or the Fibonacci, that's everywhere in nature. What what makes this stand out as Venusian? Um, OK. Um, well, when there are encounters um, and people have gone to, uh, to Venus and they've described uh, they've described the bees there and uh, and of course, uh, in the ancient civilizations, the connection, uh, it's always the goddess that's associated with the bee. For example, in, in, um, in Egypt and uh, in, in Sumer, you had the goddess Inanna, and uh, she was right. the, the bee goddess. And then anytime you see a, a, a statue or something of, of Inanna, she always has the wings of a bee. Right, and there, there, there's a connection there too because uh, uh, when you read the third book in the series, uh, Cosmic Ray's Excellent Venus Adventure, um, there's uh, the story about the Venusians and their contact with other uh, spacefaring civilizations and wars and colonization and, and a, a forced hybridization that took place on Venus, much as it did on Earth with another spacefaring civilization that combined the, uh, that did a hybridization of bee, the indigenous bees with, uh, uh, with some Venusians. So the, the, the actual depiction of, um, of Inanna might not actually be far off. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, so you, you've written books on Venus and studied Venusians. Have you studied the other planets as well in our solar system? Oh, oh yes. Uh -huh. They're all, in, they're all um, inhabited. They're all populated. They're either colonized um, by um, confederation uh, members uh, or, else, um, they have, or the, else they have their own indigenous for, forms of life. So about what's happening in, on our planet right now, are they aware of what's happening on our planet? And are they going to provide assistance to eradicate what's happening? Um, yes, they're working behind the scenes to, to help us. They can't directly interfere until we've, until we've achieved certain, uh, certain goals uh, uh, as a society, until we have a, a planetary governance, until we have... Uh, uh, until we have uh, um, a planetary energy grid, um, until we um, uh, uh, until we establish uh, peace among uh, uh, among nations and so forth, and uh, uh, you know establish protocols for um, to constrain the use of uh, weapons of mass destruction and these kind of these kind of things. Um, and, until then, um, our spirit, they just look at us as though our spiritual maturity uh, has not caught up with our technological advancements. So they're keeping a close, uh, close eye on us. And uh, when, when we're ready, um, then they'll make their, their presence known. There was a Russian scientist that developed this system called the his name was Kardashev, and he named the system after himself. And uh, it's about the the. Uh, the oh, uh, Gurdjieff! Are you talking about Gurdjieff? Uh, yes, uh, the the, uh, the the cosmic development of uh, evolution of civilizations. Right. Uh, so we're we're at the point where uh, we could either blow ourselves up or we could advance. Um, 
into a into a star faring civilization uh we're we're right at the we're right at the precipice um right right now so they they kind of look at us like uh, children playing with matches in a dynamite shack so it's uh it's something that we have to really be concerned about so who are on this planet are helping humanity to to rise then and how do we identify those beings well they they work uh, behind the scenes with the various uh, various contacts we know that throughout history um m many leaders have come out and said that they've uh, that they've they've been in contact with Venusians or even traveled to uh, the Venus, uh, uh, Dante, uh, the third and ninth council yeah, yeah. of Il Paradiso. Uh, then we have Emmanuel Swedenborg. Yeah, Swedenborg. Traveled to, to the planet Venus and meeting various intelligences there. Nikola Tesla. Um, and we, we know that they're in contact with various scientists and leaders behind the scenes. Uh, I explore the contacts of Valiant Thor with uh, President Eisenhower and so forth in the first uh, uh, in the first book as well. And uh, so, who was Valiant Thor? Uh, Valiant Thor was an emissary that was sent uh, that was sent from from Venus uh, to the Earth to talk to. Uh, President Eisenhower and to present him with uh, uh, with various artifacts, uh, uh, recording devices that he could look at uh, at uh, uh, life on Venus, and he offered him uh, 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 various knowledge about space medicine and things of a peaceful nature, and encouraged um, the nonproliferation of nuclear weapons and everything. That's, that became into effect in various protocols in 1966 uh, with the United States and the Soviet Union and the United Nations. And uh, it's all explored. Um, um, it's all explored in detail in uh, Venus Rising in the first book. In your first book? Yes. And I also published uh, the original pictures uh, with the the stamp of August C. Roberts on the back, the photographer who took Valiant Thor's picture and the other ones, and others at the at a meeting in the Highbridge, New Jersey Flying Saucer Club uh, in the late 1950s at uh, Howard Menger's farm. So this and, was a this was an actual. So when you say he was a Venusian representative. Was he born on this earth or was he brought here somehow or what happened exactly? Well, Dr. Frank Strange has said that before Valiant Thor uh, um, became recruited by, by the Venusians that at some time in the past, uh, he was born on earth, but became a translated being and then became a commander of a spaceship uh, called the Victor, the Victor One. Uh, on Venus. So what exactly is a translated being? Uh, he, he was on the earth, uh, uh, born as a regular uh, human being, and then uh, he was instantaneously changed, um, like in the twinkling of an eye. He underwent a kind of process that enabled him to live on other planetary conditions. And then he was uh, lifted up and taken to taken to Venus. I see. And is there is there a source that records that information somewhere? Oh, um, uh, yes. Um, this is Dr. Frank Stranges, and um, he um, he had the uh, UFO organization in California, NICUFO. National Investigation Committee on UFOs, and uh, have a lot of his material, right. and a lot of his uh, a lot of his original material that I that uh, that I work with, and and photos of uh, 
of him and others of Valiant Thor and Howard Menger, a contactee uh, in New Jersey that have never been seen before, uh, that I put on uh, Jeff Rentz's site as well as um, as well as uh, uh, other locations, and some of them in my you know in, in my books. Yeah, this was uh, this was. Uh, that's Dr. Frank Strangis right there. Right. Now this was uh, to August C. Roberts, the photographer who took the original pictures of Valiant Thor out, okay. at, the, uh, uh, out at Howard Mingers. So that all of these are in my, uh, all of these are in my collection. And uh, all these old documents I use as references in writing these books and uh, in, in articles. So it's all documented and verified. In the very first book, there's over 600 footnotes. So, so is Venus the planet you've, you've um, explored the most of all of them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, that's, that is my specialty. That is my forte. <laughs> Venus is your forte. And why did you choose Venus to be your forte? Because of that... Uh, contact um yes i was yeah i was it's not so much that i chose it this is maybe it chose me or i've been you, yeah, I agree. in that in that direction i had an open heart surgery at the veterans hospital in pittsburgh and um, had quadruple bypass surgery uh in 2015 and i met my higher self in the near-death experience and was taken up to a ring of light high, high above the earth and uh, offered the chance to either come back to earth and finish writing these Venus books and imparting th that information or to go on to um, go on to Venus. So I, I knew that I was, then I knew that I was born to write these books. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm fulfilling right. my, my, my passion and my mission at the same time. So when you had your near-death experience, in that experience, your next phase was to become an inhabitant of Venus? Um, yes, yes, that's right. Wow, that's fascinating. So since, since the original contact with the Venusians, how many other contacts have you had with Venusians? And, and in regards to Valiant Thor, the gentleman that you mentioned, and um, his contact with um, Frank Strange, were you at all involved in any of this? Did you ever meet any of these people? Um, some, some of them I have, that I have met, and uh, of course, um, uh, others that I know have met some of the the other ones, like uh, like R Rob Potter, for for example. Right. Some of the other speakers there at Mount Chasta uh, have have met some of the the other ones, and and I have to say that uh, we don't really know um, when we've been in contact with the Venusians and when they may have been helping us from uh, from from behind the scenes right. or steer, steering us in a certain direction. And I think that uh, we should pay attention to uh, the inclinations that, that, that we have, the intuition that we have, that we should, uh, that we should follow that. If, if we're fascinated by a certain planet or a star group, um, then we should follow up on that because uh, It'll definitely lead. Uh, it'll definitely lead us uh, to to further encounters and uh, very profound experiences. So it's not to be overlooked. Right. So, would you say then each of us is 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 from a particular star seed, or we all inhabit all star seeds? Uh, no, I believe we all have a we we all have a particular, particular. Uh, gr group, especially um, 
And I'm just referring to those who are aware. Right. Uh, you know, if we're into metaphysical subjects, paranormal mm -hmm. research, flying saucers, and th this kind mm -hmm. of thing, it's it's not simply because we just happen to have an interest in it. It's because uh, it's an integral part of our uh, yeah. of our our psyche that we belong to the stars and something deep within us recognizes that that fact and uh, so by all means pursue it right right so in the image behind you i see is that you first of all oh yes that's that's me that's the cover of the uh the third uh, on the cover of the third book okay and in the in the image above you're with a woman Oh um, yes, that's the uh, the queen of outer space. That's Dolores Barrios, and uh, uh, hers hers is a very long story. She is a translated being um, that uh, is um, four hundred and uh, forty one years old. Wow! And he, and you've met her? Uh, yes, there's several pictures of her with. Uh, with me and all these Venus books. Right, and is she, so she's been living here for, for over 400 years? Uh, yes, yeah, she, she, she has. Be going back between the, um, the, the Earth and, and Venus. Right, and is that in, in multiple reincarnations or is this in the same incarnation? Uh, this is the same one. Once a, once a being has been, has been uh, uh, translated, um, they're in, they're in a, uh, uh, they're in, they're in a body that, uh, that doesn't have to be reincarnated. So, so basically kind of like Enoch then. Right, and and well, she ex she explores prior incarnations leading up to her translation. Oh wow! And yeah, and those, is she written? Are, a um, yeah, I I I've written it in the um, in the Venus Rising. Okay, so you've told her story in Venus Rising. Yes, I told her story and. Uh, She's made some public statements before at various times, and uh, they were recorded in uh, in newspaper accounts, which I have published in the the actual newspaper accounts and interviews, uh, the Los Angeles Daily News and uh, and uh, uh, a Brazilian magazine, a Brazilian UFO club. Uh, newsletter and um, and other, other other documents fascinating amazing so so then um, I'm kind of running out of questions probably because I don't have the context to ask the questions I'll have to read your books first to be able to come up with more questions for you because right now I I seem to have these these abstract questions I want to ask you but I want to go deeper. Like for example, do we have do we have a description of all the different species and on all the different planets, what they look like, what their characteristic is? In the Lady Columba book is a really good one for for that because the last picture that I show there with uh, the the interplanetary council meeting has the various types of beings that are seated around the table, so you right. see a hybrid bee and. Uh, so when I when I see that image, it seems to be like an intermingling of animals and and humans and maybe androids. Oh oh yes yes it's a very uh, it's a very uh, it's a very unique unique picture and uh, but it, it it confirms uh, the existence of these aliens that are reported by some of the other contactees as well. Uh, one of them there has a blue avian, for example. And um, uh, I, I know one of the one of the contemporary contactees just does talk about the creature like that. 
there's a Ganesha being in there, like an elephantine uh, type. Right. And then there are several different kinds of humanoids. And then there are some humanoids that are, that are uh, hyper advanced evolutionary wise, may, maybe a million or more years ad, more advanced than us in their, in their ev uh, physical evolution in their body and everything so we see what the what they look like and what will probably look like millions of years in the, the future um so it's a it's a great book because she gives details uh about uh, these other uh, other worlds that uh, even the contemporary contactees don't go too much uh into and uh, of course another one who did that was uh uh, was Dr. Frank Stranges, who wrote about Belly and Thor, but he also wrote about these other confederation uh, uh, entities uh, as as well. And uh, some of that literature is hard to um, come by, but I but I do have uh, some records of that as well. So, but like for example, when I see that picture. That's very different than the normal thing I'm used to seeing, like greys and, and reptilians and, and, and these other uh, motifs of, of extraterrestrial physical characteristics. So it just, uh, it makes me wonder if these are more primitive from a past time period, and then the, the greys and, and whatnot are from what, a future time period? Is that what we're saying? Well, I think I think the greys are more of the uh, uh, robotic and, and android type uh, artificial uh, bioengineered constructs, and uh, and and um, well, I have uh, let's see, I think I have it I have it with me. Uh, uh, George Hunt Williamson started writing about. Uh, some of the races that uh, don't have the best intentions uh, right. toward, toward us. Uh, other Tongues, Other Flesh, he talks about, uh, was published in 19, like 1953 or 1951, something like that. He wrote about, um, he wrote about um, the reptilians uh, way back then and uh, and these malicious beings that came from the Orion uh, Nebula, uh, and uh, and Dr. Frank Stranges wrote a book or a booklet um, in uh, I think like 1962 about the uh, I'm looking for it here. Uh, it was um, oh yeah. Danger from the stars, a warning, uh, a warning from space by Dr. Frankie Stranges. And, uh, and uh, it says, there is a, he said, there is a message of hope, not of doom. But uh, he talks about the, the different positive forces, which were aligned with with uh, more angelic type things in the confederation of planets. So we have guardian angels, uh, angel reapers, um, and we have uh, ministering angels and so forth, and then fallen, uh, fallen angels. So you have these other, the, these other beings, and then he documents cases where, where pilots have been shot down or hurt by UFOs, right. uh, uh, where uh, people have been abducted, and then he talks about, uh, you know, greys and uh, reptilians and some of these other uh, uh, entities. So it's not that, that everything is, is peaches and cream out there in outer space. Right. Um, well, it, that's, that's inevitable considering what we have here. It's probably the same anywhere else. Right, right. And, and even but at the same time, at the same time, I want to say that if they're evolved beings, I would hope that they're in an evolutionary state that makes them predominantly good rather than good and evil. Oh, oh yes. So we're talking about the, um, 
the good ones being in a confederation of planets. And it's very interesting that recently uh, uh, we've had the, some uh, leaders from go different governments come out and acknowledge the existence of such a, uh, su such a body. Um, there was Paul Hellyer, who was a, a minister of defense in Canada. Uh, he talked about uh, 80 different species out there uh, and the, that were uh, coming to visit the earth. And he said only a small um, percentage of those uh, had uh, suspicious intentions and that the, the rest came from a confederation of planets that meant us uh, well. And then there was uh, an Israeli space uh, director who just came out and talked about a confederation of planets as, uh, as, as well. So this isn't um, just Star Trek stuff. This is for real. Right, right. So um, you mentioned Paul, Paul uh, Hellyer. Who else has? Um, uh, well, there's been there have been astronauts that have talked about it. Uh, um, there have been, uh, you know, Air Force people. The recent revelations about uh, uh, from the, the CE five disclosure that Stephen Greer came up and, with, and etc. Exactly, and and Navy pilots uh, seeing craft that with astounding um, technology, thousands if not millions of years in advance. Of, of our own in these uh, objects. And, and the, the government recently admitted that there's a technology, a super technology behind the UFOs, although they weren't quite ready to admit that it's extra uh, extraterrestrial. But of course, what, what else could it be? I mean, if it was, if it was from, uh, if it was uh, from a power that was hostile or, or that wasn't being kept in check by an even higher power, then they would have taken over down here um, uh, thousands of years ago, as John A. Keel once said. True. And then um, apparently, I guess at the end of the month or nearing the end of the month, there's going to be a government disclosure. If, if oh, uh, yes. They said there, there would be, but then they just they came out with it and they said that uh, they did admit there's a technology behind UFOs, but they wouldn't say that it's extraterrestrial. And right. I did an article, and I predicted that that would be the outcome. I did an article on Lon Strickler's uh, phantomsandmonsters.com um, about the beginning of the UFO disclosure movement, beginning in 1977, uh, with a meeting of scientists from around the world in Acapulco, Mexico, uh, including uh, uh, Jacques Vallée, the Canadian, or the uh, French computer expert, uh, uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who is a scientific consultant to Project Blue Book uh, in the United States, and uh, uh, many others uh, from India all over, demanding that uh, their governments come out with the facts about flying saucers. Right. And that was the beginning of an official disclosure movement. That 1977 was also the year that um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the Spielberg movie came out. Right. And that was based on a real um, e event called Project Serpo, but that would be a whole nother program. <laughs> and then right. uh, we, have, right. we have Jimmy Carter seeing a UFO outside uh, of um, a Lions Club in, uh, in Georgia and that when he was running for, for governor. And then when he was running for president uh, in, in 1976, a few years later, one of his promises is that he would issue a re order that a report be issued on disclosure of uh, what UFOs really are, but then when he, well, when he got in office, then he, he could he never followed through on it. Uh, it's an old story. Right, probably because he couldn't. Um, right. The other question I have is when you're talking about contact and you making contact, 
the being you experience was female and humanoid, correct? Um, yes, that, that's right. And so, um, and same when I talked to Robert Porter, or Robert Potter, um, he also mentioned that, that the being was humanoid and, and female. So is that, a, that a, uh, consistent with other contactee experiences? Uh, well, in the case of... Uh, uh, in the case of Venus. In the case of the contactees, um, myself, Robert, and, uh, uh, and others, uh, there have been many, uh, um, many Venusians that have... Uh, 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 males and females that have, sh have shown up. Uh, uh, one of them that showed up with... Uh, uh, with uh, uh, with Rob and uh, uh, Commander Reigns was uh, the security security chief, and right. uh, but uh, of course he didn't allow his picture to, to to be taken. But he did the uh, he he did the uh, the the filming with uh, with Rob at that particular uh, event for that interview. It was in a public place in a in a library. Right, right. And so when it's in a public place, then they can, uh, I guess, morph into a humanoid. Oh, oh yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Well, I'm running out of questions to ask you. Is there anything you want to share that I have? Uh, no. Uh, just uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present some of the information. I. I hope that uh, those uh, who really would uh, like to understand about uh, the mysteries of our closest planetary neighbor and um, the conditions on that planet, which uh, can be applied to uh, the Earth to make our world a paradisical one, will uh, we'll, we'll yeah. check out my... They're all going to be on Kindle. Right now, the only one on Kindle is uh, uh, the Venus rising, the first one. Okay. Uh, but the, okay. but yes, they can get that one on uh, uh, on Kindles. So that that's only uh, that's only a fraction of the cost. It is on the Canadian website too for uh, for Amazon in Canada. Right. Now, uh, of course, uh, if they if they just want it quicker. And um, they could go right to headlinebooks.com right. and you know, order it directly from there. All right, all right, Raymond. Thank you so much. Oh, you're 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 quite welcome.